All right, so we're in Ephesians 6. So within this passage from Ephesians 6, uh, verses 10 through 20, there's an exhortation to stand or stand firm, depending on your translation. Now, as we come into chapter 6, verse 14, this is actually the fourth time that this command has been given. Having been mentioned in verse 11, which says, um, chapter 6, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand firm against the scheme of the devil. And twice in, in verse 13, therefore take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist on the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. So we the idea of resisting and standing firm are both there together. The, um, the thrust of Paul's words changes tone. As we move out of the ideas of what should we do in the beginning, putting on, we're actually told to put on the armor of God to begin with. And in doing the putting on the arm of God, we're to, we're to stand firm. Now Paul's tone, when you get to verse 14, shifts. And the command, instead of the implication, the command is to stand firm, having done these four things. And, or, yeah, the four things that we're going to look at. Uh, verse 14 is having belted, having put on, as we're going to look at today. Verse 15, having strapped on. And verse 16, having taken up. We're to stand firm, having done those things. And the whole aspect implies a set of readiness, that we're to be ready to do these things. We're to be ready in armor. Martha you know, brought it up. I didn't prompt Martha, but Martha said, you know, when you're on deployment, you don't sleep in your jammy pants and then suddenly wake up and say, oh, I, I think I'll change what I'm going to wear today. I might go into battle. When you're on deployment, you're ready all the time. You're sleeping in your uh, gear over which you might put armor. So Paul's emphasis changes and here the command is to stand firm. Not that standing firm is just a result of doing the other things. It's he's commanding the church to be standing firm. And if the church can't be known as a church that stands firm, what is the church for? And the, the short answer is nothing. It's for whatever then comes to mind. All right, so we're going to, again, stand firm, having done these, these four things. All right, um, so what we're going to look at today is the idea of having put on, and we're going to look at the idea of putting on um, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, so again, the idea of standing firm is that two, is that these are not meant to be done, okay, in your mind, put on the belt of truth, put on the breastplate, rather they're all to be done simultaneously. Um, any of you ever tried doing two or three things at once? <laughs> how many of you have you have it, have any of you with success tried doing two things at once two or three things at once yeah it was, you know the idea of multitasking is a is a complete misnomer humans are not wired that way um they're actually doing what's called in the technology business they're called doing code switching so instead of following one stream of consciousness you know i'm going to cook an egg I can actually let the egg cook but i'm not doing multiple things with the egg cooking i'm just setting the egg there and it's cooking that I suppose you could say is multitasking. But at the same time, then I'm trying to find my spam, which goes with my ham and egg, with my eggs, my spam and eggs. Um, I've got to pay attention. I don't burn the spam. So I can't be, I, I've got to be switching back and forth, but I can't be doing both the spam and the egg both at the same time. I'm doing one or the other. Now they're cooking both at the same time. So there's a multitasking aspect to it. But in terms of what I'm doing, I'm just doing one thing at a time. I might be switching back and forth frequently so I'm quit, so code switching back and forth between these two things, but I'm not really multitasking. And, and what, but, but what Paul's asking for here is for all these things to be done simultaneously. And it gives the aspect of, even the aspect of you know, being uh, multitasking, it gives the aspect of, I need to be ready to do these things all at once. I can't be caught by surprise by a while of the enemy, a scheme of the enemy, as he'll put it later on. Um, they're all to be done simultaneously. And so it lends this urgency that's there. If you read the passage, when it just said, you know, when you get around to it, um, you know, take some, some uh, weight, weight lifting exercises about being strong in the Lord and, you know, put on the, put on the, um, put on the full armor of God piece at a time and see how it goes. There's no aspect of that. There's no aspect of if, and then it's an aspect of rush. This is hard. We're in a battle and you want to be ready. 
as we looked at a few weeks ago, for our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And Paul's not articulating necessarily a hierarchy in those verses, but he's saying between here and the throne of God, there are people who are arrayed in armor and battle against us. We ought to be ready for that, those attacks. There's also a sense, too, where um, in, in highlighting the sense of urgency, when you come to Second Peter, which again we've been looking at in the Men's Fellowship, in your faith supply moral excellence and your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and in your self-control perseverance, and in your perseverance godliness, and in your godliness brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness love, you get the idea here of planning, submitting, evaluating, being disciplined, executing, trusting, and resting. But you get the sequential idea that you do this and then this and then this and then this. And that's not what Paul's saying here, all at once. Ready, be ready for the battle. Um, so the emphasis is it's urgent. All right, so all of that is just really sort of a way of reviewing um, and then not so much wasting time, but the choir will come in any second now. <laughs> all right, so last week when we looked at, uh, we stopped with uh, Ephesians 6, 14. Um, stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth. And now we look on having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So I'm going to have you, uh, uh, let's see, let me let me read my, let me stick to my script. Uh, last week, we looked at truth like a belt, which gathers all those loose flowing garments together so that we can fight in an unobstructed manner. So we can run in an unimpeded manner. Um, so we don't get, we don't give something that, like the enemy to grab. One of the things I hate about flag football is there's always a flag to, to grab. You, you don't necessarily need to be that close to the person. All you have to be is close enough to grab the flag. And, and it kind of defeats the point of football to begin with. Um, what, what, we, what having the belt does is becomes a place where all those loose garments can be gathered so that there's nothing for the enemy to grab, you will, if you will, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, but now we move to the second phrase, understand firm, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So let's take a look at 1 Samuel. I'm gonna, you, you can, I, I've got them up here. So if you want to uh, just pay attention here, you can, you can write Dean's take down. But 1 Samuel Chapter 17, verse 5. This is going to seem to be unrelated, but I'll, I'll come around to why what is. Um, so 1 Samuel 17, 5. And he had a bronze helmet. Lost my notes. And he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. Now, 1 Samuel 17, 5. Anybody remember what that's about? Yes, it is. Um, so 5,000 shekels of, of bronze. Anybody know about what 5,000 shekels of bronze weighs, per chance? <laughs> about 125 pounds. That's exactly right. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, now Goliath being, you know, two and a half feet taller than anybody near him uh, is able to bear a little bit more weight, uh, more than likely. But um, what we call, what what the, the Bible calls scale armor, we would call... Um, something like a chain mail or a coat of mail. So here's an example of what this looks like. Um, if you can, it's you can see all these scales that go from one end to the other, and they would be, you know, you'd have essentially a, a wire which would hold all the top pieces, another wire to do all the side pieces to keep them from flopping around too much. But you, you can imagine after a little while, all that bronze front and back gets to weigh a little bit. Again, for, for Goliath, it's about 125 pounds. Um, but when you talk about the chain mail that's talked about in the Old Testament, this is the idea you should have in mind. Now, the reason I bring this up is that uh, this is only about 300 years before Isaiah would be writing. And that's what we're going to look at next. So, again, what the New American Standard calls scale armor, today we would call coat of mail. So this is a picture of Assyrian armor from the period closer to David and Goliath, about 350 years before Isaiah was written. And my point in bringing this up is that the technology existed in, in the time of David and Goliath and was likely the kind of technology and usage in Isaiah's time. So one of the questions you have to ask is the things we read in the, in the Ephesians, are those exactly the same kind of technology? Did that technology exist at the time that uh, we, you know, a lot of people refer back to, to 1 Samuel or to Isaiah? And of course, what, what I'm saying is it does. And so it would look something like this. 
Uh, maybe not exactly like that, but it would look something like this in terms of having the chain mail. Again, so Goliath, as I mentioned, rough, stands roughly two and a half feet taller than men of his day. So the breastplate was larger and Goliath's breastplate weighed about 125 pounds. You get the idea of having, it's heavy, but it does its job as we'll, uh, for the most part, see in a little bit. So back to our text. Um, now I'm going to turn over to Isaiah 59. Because in a lot of respects, what, what Paul is doing in Ephesians is quoting this Isaiah 59 passage, Isaiah 59, 17. Paul said, or Isaiah 59, 17 says, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he wrapped, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal as a cloak. So we'll get into what those mean. We're just going to walk through this passage together because it lends light on what is it Paul would infer is the meaning we want to bring forward. What's the principle we want to bring forward from Isaiah, you know, written 650 years before Paul or so. What's that meaning we want to bring forward that Paul's trying to hone in on? And it's not, it's obvious. It's not, not hard to determine. But the first question we have to ask is, who's the he? Who's the he of he put on righteousness? We'll go back to verse 15, where it says, The Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. So imagine, if you will, a lawless society. And lawless society where the police force isn't doing what it should be doing. And the people aren't caring. And it, it's difficult to even worry about justice and peace in your society. That's what Isaiah is decrying as a prophet. And he's decrying it, not from his point of view, but from God's point of view. And God says, uh, the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. And in turn, then, God gets upset, and God says, this is what's going to happen. And then by the time we get to verse 17, talks about it in the past tense, and he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. It is the coming king, the Messiah, who will come to bring justice and act justly. He'll act righteously. He will bring righteousness into the land. So that's when I say, when Paul's bringing these things up from Old Testament view, he's bringing them up as these armaments are battle-tested. They were done by the king. They were done by the Messiah king. And so you can use them too. They're used, they're used by the spirit in his life. So again, the he here is, is the Lord himself. So this breastplate was a, was a coat of mail. It covered the body from the neck to the thighs um, or the chest area. And it consisted of two parts, one for the front and one for the back. Um, so, you know, there's some question comes in. Sometimes people, commentators will say, well, you know, the only thing that's mentioned is the breastplate. And therefore, it must be the, you know, you wore the front and the back. Which part, which part of your kidneys don't you want protected? It's a, it's a kind of a silly question. You know, which, which part of the armament don't you want to have covered? Um, but again, the language that Isaiah uses, he put on righteousness like a breastplate. So in, in our English language, we call the, when something men, someone mentions, uh, this is like that, or this is, you know, this like that, that's called a simile, correct? So Isaiah uses a simile to say that um, Isaiah is, is the important part about what Isaiah is putting on, is that he put on the breastplate? No. He put on breastplate, he put on righteousness like a breastplate. He wore it front and back. No matter what he was coming or going or rising or standing, righteousness defines the king, the Messiah, coming Messiah king. Righteousness defines what he's trying to do and be within the community, within the, the, the city and the state. The important part is that Isaiah is trying to tell us as he put on righteousness. And if you get nothing else out of the next, you know, the last two weeks and in the coming three or four weeks, understand that the, the armor of God, the important part isn't the armor. Those are metaphors. I'm sorry. Those are similes for the underlying character that he expects the body of Christ to have. He expects the body of Christ to have truth. He expects the body of Christ to have righteousness. He expects the body of Christ to have the gospel. And the metaphors just help us understand it in a kind of a visual way what it is the church is supposed to be doing. So don't miss that point. The, the metaphors of the armor are interesting. But as I mentioned last week, you know, God doesn't want a bunch of little soldiers running around. He wants the church of Christ to be known by these characteristics and these qualities. And as such, it prepares us for warfare. 
So the important thing is Isaiah was trying to tell us he put on righteousness. It was visible to all who observed that this was his character and this was his style. So, um, so a soldier's armor uh, that covers from, from chest to, to essentially the thighs from uh, front and back. Um, the breastplate is something was was meant to be, um, do I have it here? Uh, it's coming here. Um, First Kings chapter 22 says, uh, now one man drew his bow and at random and struck Ahab, the king of Israel, in a joint of the armor. And he said to the driver of his chariot, turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am severely wounded. Shoot up here amongst us. One of us got to have some relief. Um, for the choir just came in. When I talk about the, the, the chain mail or the, the scale armor uh, from uh, 1 Samuel 17 or Isaiah 59, this is kind of, this is a, a Syrian armor about the same period of time. Um, so this is what it would look like. Just keep that visual in your head. It would be these these scales of bronze, which had a tendency to weigh a lot, and uh, these scales of bronze. But you can see that if someone happened to be shooting at just the right oblique angle, like a um, Patrick Kane um, shot in one of the, um, the all of a sudden the hockey just, the hockey metaphor just went complete out of my head. <laughs> but an oblique shot by Patrick Kane, somehow that arrow pierced one of the joints and it kills and it, and it mortally wounds King Ahab. And so he pulls off to the side. And you remember King Ahab, this was, it was prophesied that, that uh, dogs would lap up his blood. And where did, where did King Ahab die? In his chariots near a bunch of dogs. And so they lapped up his blood, as, even as they escorted his body away. So the, if you can picture then that these arrows getting in, the, in one of the joints, that's what, what happened to fulfill prophecy. So back to uh, chapter 6, verse 14 of Ephesians. Um, what, what was I quoting here? Oh, wait. I'll come later. All right, so... Uh, we'll get to that next section in a second. Um, so now we move from observation to application by asking some rather involved question. What is this nature of this righteousness? Because we hear about righteousness a lot, but we have to ask question because it's one of two kinds of righteousness. Now, I'm not going to give you a pop quiz as to which one you think I mean, because I haven't told you anything. So that'd be unfair to give answer my questions without me having given you any information. It'll be fun for me, but not so much for you. <laughs> Is this righteousness imputed or is this righteousness experienced? Imputed. Huh? Imputed. That's one answer. And the other answer is? Experience. Experience. All right, so I'm going to give you my, uh, my thoughts here in a little bit. So uh, is the righteousness coming to me or is the righteousness coming from me? And again, we'll talk about why, why this question. So in, in the aspect of thinking about whether it's imputed or not, some commentators are convinced that the righteousness here is God's righteousness, meaning that it's imputed to us. We don't have God's righteousness other than what God has imputed to our account on our behalf. When we read uh, Romans chapter 3, um, when we read Romans chapter 3, uh, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. But it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. When we think about the order of salvation, you know, several things happen all at once. Once the we've been elected, we've been called, and all at once, the Spirit brings to our mind the ability to repent uh, it brings to our body by making us alive in Christ. And so we're regenerated, um, we're justified, and we're adopted. And these things happen all at once. Again, all immediately, not all you know, sequentially. Um, so when we read this passage, um, it becomes important to us to kind of understand that when he's talking about... Um, I, did, I stopped, stopped the middle of the sentence. Um, so as I... <laughs> being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Again, what's propitiation? 
That's my, here's my, here's your real pop quiz for today. Cause this one you should know. Substitute. substitute is sort of right, but substitute for the purpose of what? Of what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation is accomplished because of this. Yes. You're all close, <laughs> but not close enough. No, propitiation is the satisfaction of wrath. God's wrath is done away with. It's propitiated in the sense of Christ has taken on that wrath that was meant for us. Christ has taken on the penalty meant for us. So what you all said was true. They're either coming into propitiation or they're coming from propitiation. So, so um, this was demonstrated. At public displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, God's righteousness, because in God's merciful restraint, he let the sins previously committed go unpunished. For the demonstration, that is, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So what Paul's talking about in, in this part in Romans is the idea of imputed righteousness. It is God's righteousness which has been credited to our account. The thing which evens all the balances, if you will. It does away with the debt, and actually his righteousness then, as we're called into his kingdom and being made children of God, we're part of the inheritance now. We're rich beyond measure in the righteousness that we have. Now, is the righteousness is not of my own, but it is a righteousness credited to my account. And if you think about Jesus's role here on earth today, he's either a, a, uh, an intercessor praying for us, or he's an advocate praying for us when we've messed up, reminding the Father that God's righteousness himself has been imputed to this individual because of faith in Christ. And those are wonderful things, but it's happening outside of us. But there's a certain confidence, there's a certain freedom that comes when we remember this. How does Romans 8, 1 begin? Really loud. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are Christ Jesus. The the right. There is no there is therefore now no condemnation. Imagine if you're going into battle and you're encumbered with the aspect of I'm not ready, I'm not worthy. What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? Are you going to fight your best? No, you're going to fight hesitatingly. You're going to fight with um things rambling through your head. And, and be not paying attention to what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be defending the person to the right of me and to the left of me. I'm supposed to be defending against the arrows. I'm supposed to be thinking about how am I supposed to be righteous in this in aspect? How do I declare truth? How do I act like truth? How do I be like truth? If I don't have a clean conscience about my righteousness and I'm in God's army, I'm not really a good soldier, am I? But what we find is that, is that if this is talking about imputed righteousness, it's the imputed righteousness which prepares us for battle because it makes us have a clean conscience. It gives us the freedom to know that we're fighting on the right side, number one, and we're fighting with God as our strength and our supply. So there's an aspect where this view makes sense. And so we have God's righteousness. We find when we get to Romans 8, as we said, there's no condemnation. The mind's not encumbered of what if someone finds out my sin or will I be discarded or set aside? There's freedom of consciousness, the freedom of conscience. There's no accusing conscience that hinders us from the being focused on the spiritual battle that's ahead. And, you know, even though Satan is a roaring liar and seeking to devour people, we're not concerned because we have a clean conscience. Um, F.F. Bruce said, um, just in contrast, though, so that's the that's the ethical um, point of view, in the set, or the uh, the imputed point of view, in that it's a righteousness which comes from without, and again, this was the common commentator point of view for pretty much all commentaries written up through about the mid twentieth uh, century. But then some things started to happen, as people start to discover or put two and two together and get four, they start to see different patterns in scripture. Um, they came up with a different conclusion. So a lot of the commentaries written in the last you know, 75 years or so have the idea that it's not this, not as, it's not imputed, but rather it's experiential or it's ethical or it's, and if you think that actually coheres with the idea of what's going on with truth, 
last thing, one last week, one of the things I said is that if we're proclaiming truth, one of the follow-ons is that if we're proclaiming truth and being truth, then from that truth comes righteousness. Not just in terms of my, my righteousness as a standing before God, but my righteousness as seen by the community. Because think back what we said in Isaiah 59. Let's see if I can get there real quick. Nope. There's no quick. There we go. And he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. This is God who is doing this because there's no justice in the land. If there's no justice in the land, and I just talk about the imputed righteousness, what good would that do society? How would anybody know that I'm being righteous if I'm not acting righteous? Does that make sense? Right? When God saves us, he expects us to be different because we are different. He expects us to act differently, be differently, behave differently. All right, if I can get back to where I was. F.F. F. Bruce says this, he says, it is righteousness as an ethical quality that is meant rather than truth of doctrine and justification by faith. Uh, though the latter are not unrelated to the ethical qualities. So while the first view makes sense, we find that commentators of a more recent generation discount that view for some very good reasons. Instead, they opt for the experienced or ethical or experiential. Now, I, the reason I bring in experiential, if you read in the, any of the Puritans, uh, like John Newton, for instance, would be one of the people I would refer to. They always talk about experiential rather than experienced or experimental. Um, you know, they would talk about experimental, not experiential. All right. So um, I know you understand what I think I said. <laughs> the Puritans would talk about. <laughs> you okay, there, Dan? <laughs> That's right. I'll slow down. <laughs> As if that'll make a difference. <laughs> All right, so the Puritans would more talk about the uh, aspect of experimental. In other words, I'm experimenting with being a Christian. Um, we would today, it's just an old way of saying, it's a 200 year old way of saying, today we would talk about experiential, the things I'm experiencing in being a Christian. Um, does that help for all of you who have suddenly got a headache? Okay. Acts of the person coming from the inner man that exhibited through the outer man. If the inner man has changed, then how do we know that except by what comes from the outer man? If, if all I'm saying is in my lips, I'm saying I'm one person or I'm one thing, but I'm not any different, am I really that thing? And yet what we find is thinking about Isaiah 59 in relation to what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians, he's saying the Messiah King comes and he's different because of a lack of justice in the land. He brings justice. Not just in people's minds, but in people's experience. And what he's what Paul's really saying is, like Isaiah, we are the, the we are the army of God, and we are have not only belted ourselves with truth, we are put on the righteousness like a breastplate, and we therefore are different in the community, and we're known by that difference. Imagine if a church is no different than everybody else surrounding it. What is the purpose of the church? We are, we are meant to be known as being different, aren't we? Um, the idea of putting on salvation that one has, just like we saw the putting on commands of chapter 4, verse 24. This is, I'm putting on my salvation, I'm putting on the truth, I'm putting on righteousness. Therefore, people know this because they experience it from me and with me. We find that in our, in our ethical or our exper experiential day-to-day -day life, that we're imitators of God. That was Ephesians chapter 5. We're imitators of God who act righteously, even as we fight like God, as we saw in Isaiah 59. God expects us to be different because we are different. Let's see. Andrew Lincoln said this. He says, the righteousness or justice of Yahweh is an attribute that's now essential for the believer to display, which is really what Bruce was saying as well. While Bruce and Lincoln are saying we really think it's experiential that's meant to be seen. It has its lineage from being who I am because of declaration by Christ. Can I be righteous without having been declared to be righteous? I can be righteous-ish, 
But without being having this declaration by God that I am righteous by his blood, I am not righteous. Therefore, really, my righteous acts done unrighteously are as wood, hay, and stubble. So there's a lineage between being declared to be righteous and acting righteously. So you, what I'm really going to say is that I think it's both. So that's not a hedge of bets. I'm not a hedge bet kind of guy. I will tell you when I fall down, a, I'll not tell you when I fall down. That's a whole other thing. But I'll tell you when I fall down on one side or the other. But here I think there's a direct lineage between God declaring us to be righteous by salvation and us continuing in that righteousness through the activities and sanctification of the spirit. When we act righteously, we're acting in God's power, not in our own. That is, God is acting through us by the Spirit. That confidence from God protects our hearts. True? When we know that we're doing what God wants us to do, there's a settled confidence, there's a settled rest that makes us ready for battle, knowing that we're on the right side. So one last thing, the nature of the command is that the believers are to engage in putting this on. This is just one more notch to say it's probably experiential, not imputed that this is referring to, but it, it has its foundation in it being imputed. But the, the nature of the command is that believers are to engage in putting this on. Believers are not told, stand over here in a corner and someone's going to bring some armor for you. And, you're, and if someone will put it on you, and when that happens, you're to go in battle. That's not the command. The command is don't rest and wait. The command is jump and be ready to put on the armor. It's something we do. It's something we have to do. And much as we read in 2 Corinthians where we're to take every thought captive, there's an activity where we participate in sanctification. Sanctification isn't something that God just brings it to me. I let go and I let God. There are other words for that. Rather, we participate with God in our sanctification by the power of the Spirit, not on our own strength necessarily. But as we're in the Word, as we're empowered by the Word, as we're meditating in the Word, as we pray about the Word, God, by His Spirit and the Word, makes us different and we act differently. So the nature of the command is that it's, it's, a, it's not passive. Forensic righteousness or accounted or reckoned righteousness is passive. We don't do a thing. God does all the accounting in the backroom operations. But he does it based on what Christ has done. Sanctification is us participating with the Spirit to, to do things and to act things, act in a righteous way. As we talked last week and reviewed earlier, we're to be ready, and being passive is not being ready. It's not being ready, it's not getting ready. The process of sanctification, of living the Christian life, is us cooperating with the Spirit of God by the Word of God to be imitators of God. And when we do this, there is joy as compared to, as we read in, in Ephesians 4, 30, what happens when we don't walk in the Spirit? We read in Ephesians 4, 30, we mm -hmm. grieve the Spirit, right? When we're not ready, we're actually grieving the Spirit. We're not doing what God has commanded. We're not being whom God has commanded. We're not being the imitators that he's asked us to be. So how do we decide and while I still hold that there is only one interpretation of Scripture, though many applications, but here's a case where both sides, both understandings, actually can be the point of the passage. I can't be righteous without God's righteousness. But I can't, and, you know, and Paul and James would agree on these statements. If I'm righteous, I'm going to act righteously. And so you're bound up into really having to present both ideas, and both ideas are actually true. So I think Paul could be speaking to both those things. Um, in our Christian experience, forensic righteousness or accounted or reckoned righteousness is the foundation of who we are. When we become saved, we are counted as righteous in Christ. It is Christ's righteousness imputed to us, and we inherit that nature. We receive it as we become regenerated. We act the way we do because we are made new. We are justified, and the Spirit of God then resides within us. We have a clear conscience to do the good works of God for which we were recreated, which is back to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. What I hope you want to hope you begin to see is that as we've looked at these, we're not done yet. Don't, don't be packing up your Bibles. <laughs> but as we've looked at these passages, 
right? What you're starting to see is the things that happened in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 that were in Christ, that were made parts of one another, were indwelt by the Spirit. All those things are coming to play in Ephesians 6. That fact that we're, we have faith and that's given to us as a gift, not of ourselves, uh, of the day man should boast, but, but we are made to be his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. You see that coming to play in Ephesians 6. Everything you see in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and how we're supposed to act differently in 4 and 5 are now coming to play in 6. It is like the biggest, uh, greatest good that any philosopher could imagine to have all this work, all these chapters, all these verses end up in this little compact 11 verse section from chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Everything here in chapter 6, verses 10 through 20 is the, is the culmination, the implication, the result of everything he's been talking about in the first five chapters. I hope you see that. What we have, as we've been looking at today in terms of righteousness, is that we are recreated to do good works. And from that, the church is made able to do righteous things. Truth begets righteousness, yes? We are able to be righteous because we have proclaimed truth and are tr acting in truth. Let's see. Isaiah 59. This is the whole passage which we alluded to. We read verse 17. But I want you to see the whole passage. Now the Lord saw, and it was displeasing in sight that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no one, and was amazed that there was no one to intercede, that then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay, wrath to his adversaries, retribution to his enemies. To the close lands, coastlands he will deal retribution. So they will fear the name of the Lord from, from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. A redeemer will come to Zion and to those in Jacob who turn from wrongdoing, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring, offspring, says the Lord from now and forever. When you start to look at the whole passage of Isaiah, it gives you a further idea of what God's trying to do. What God's trying to do is with God's army, with the church that's coming, which was predicted in the Old Testament, that there, you know, to, uh, even Isaiah, right, to bring the light to the, to the Jews is too small a thing. The Gentiles will be included also. And you start to see now how the church is the exemplification the example, if you will, of the righteousness of God flowing through the earth. Now, does that mean we're ushering in the millennium in that way? No, that's that's God's job. But what we're able to do is usher in the gospel until such a day. God is righteous. It is an attribute of his. And because it's an attribute, he must act righteously. God is true. It's a core attribute of his. And because it's an attribute, he must act truthfully. And what Paul's saying in Ephesians 6 is that the church is the same thing. The church is the armor of God, the children of God, acting in the battle of God. The church is to be known as truth and to be acting truthfully. The church is to be known as righteous, is to be acting righteously. Renewed in Christ, made his children, seated with him in the heavenlies, indwelt by the Spirit, made parts of one another, all these are how God sends us into battle. Not only should we be competent and free from conscience issues of our past sin, as the church is the army of God and dwelt by God, we should remember that God expects us to be righteous, to act righteous, and to act righteously with zeal. We should fear God more than we should fear men. True? We should fear God. We should put on, his, his, put on display his glory. We should be speaking God's truth as we read in Isaiah, acting with God's righteousness. And that's what it means to be on the offense in God's army. So I told you we would get out a little early. 
I didn't say I promised. I just, <laughs> I'm not a prophet or anything. <laughs> but any, any questions that come about as a result? So when I say act righteously, anybody unclear what that means? Anybody, can anybody, let me, let me put the question to you. What examples of what does it mean for the church when he's talking to us and us as the army of God, putting on the armor of God, what does it mean for the church to act righteously? Yeah. It makes me think of that scripture, I think in Matthew, where it says um, to let your light shine before men so that people will see your good works and glorify your father. True, that's, true. That's what comes to mind. Okay. How specifically do we do that? The answer to that question is simple. This book would not be so long. Okay. <laughs> but still, what kind of problems do we have today where the church is called on to act righteously? Our mouths. Huh? Our mouths. Okay. Yeah. Con way controlling our mouths. Yeah. The way we talk. And yeah, the manner we talk, the things we talk about. Okay. Love one another. Love one another. Encourage one another. Strengthen one another. Yeah. All the, the 31 one, one another's, right? What about standing for the unborn? That's acting righteously, isn't it? People are so afraid of being political in this area that they don't want to stand for anything. Yeah. Even Christians are one of them. People don't believe that they need to stand for it because they don't believe in absolute right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. I think when I read the day, there's so many issues that we have to stand from this being tried constantly. Yeah. The um so the young adult Bible study was over uh last night. There's only a few handful coming to that these days. One of the things we were looking at was um manners in which we conduct ourselves in our arguments in a good way, meaning that um there's ways for us to have be an argument with somebody in a winsome kind of way where we're actually asking questions more than making statements. And what you start to get to is, you know, there's ways for us to engage in people that's not offensive in terms of offensive as in they smell bad. You know, not taking a bath is a whole nother question, but that's not what the point is. Um, but not to be offensive in terms of our language or the way we come across. Because we can, we can have a dialogue about things we disagree with if we're agreeable, if we're righteous. But we can also do it um, unrighteously as well. We can act. We can act righteously, you know, coming up and against an issue, but we can act be offensive about it also. And we've got to do both those things, because we're both speakers of truth and and righteous. Yeah. For me, it's it's hard to stand firm and know where God's presence is, and that's where you've got to just kind of, you know. <sighs> Our world is falling apart. We can all probably agree with that. But where do we stand firm and where do we allow God's plan and just to work itself out? I, yeah. I don't know where that thing is at. Yeah. I'm always asking myself. That. I th I think, Rick, the I'm not so concerned about the national battle because as me as a as an individual living in Tinley Park, there's not a whole lot I can do about the national battle other than elect or impeach individuals who are doing bad jobs. But I can act. Or I could, I suppose, run for office, or I could do something for my local um, counseling center, or I could do something for my local uh, past pregnancy care center, or I could do, I mean, you know, so you can start to come up with, what do I do local? I think that's the thing we were called upon the church to do is act local. Now, there's some global aspects we can do, but I think more importantly, the church needs to be the church which stands up for the things that are local, because that's where we have our presence, I think. I don't know if that helps or not, but it keeps me from worrying about the things I can't solve, which are the the, the national or the global issues. Yeah. I'm still a little confused about the the, the phrase "what time." Does does that look like? Well, let's go back to um, if we have the Ephesians four twenty four. Christ is imputed to us, plus we got we got gifts and. Cast his righteousness into our life when we became Christians. And we, because because of that righteousness, we should have lived differently because it, it's had an effect on us. How do we put on? What does it mean to put on? 
Okay, what's it mean to put on? So again, going back to you know the, the two passages that I think are relevant to this, and they're both in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we are we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. The, the reason we're saved is for good works. True? Right. All right. But sometimes we have a trouble letting go of our old past life. And that's what's coming along in Ephesians 4. We're told to walk in the spirit in that particular place. And part of the walking in the spirit is I'm supposed to put off the old stuff, <laughs> renew the mind, and put on the new stuff. So the put on is to begin to act like my character. The put on is to, if I'm a Christian, I'm supposed to act like a Christian. If I'm righteous, if I'm imputed righteousness, I'm supposed to act righteously. If, I'm, if I have truth, I'm supposed to act truthfully. So that's what the put on is to begin to act like our identity in Christ. If I'm a child of God, I'm supposed to act like a child of God. That's what it means to put on. That help? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe he's just using the, the term the word armor. The same kind of righteousness that he talked about in, in chapter four. He's expounded on that. In yeah. Six. Yeah. So Ephesians four, you're seeing the six being the culmination of all the things I've been talking about. Now we're gonna we're gonna talk about putting on righteousness, about truth, about salvation, about gospel. He's using all these words, saying we need to have this character. He's not talking about putting on the armor. He's actually putting on. We need to put on these character, and the the armaments are just a metaphor or a simile. Yeah. So we can begin to visualize or understand it. So the put on is that's that's our responsibility part. Yes. Yeah. But we do we need to do it urgently. Right. Yeah, it's not a, if you happen to get around to it on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock, you could put on some righteousness. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Um, Ephesians 4, 8. Sometimes, you know, uh, well, okay, when you say that uh, because we're righteous, we're supposed to have righteousness. There are times when I'm just the Lord, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't feel it. But you know, sometimes you know, little things when you know when you're supposed to obey. Yeah. Well, I just I just don't want to. And um Lord help me. You, you know, so how do you okay, I guess um even when your flesh doesn't want to. Because you're righteous, or do we just appropriate and walk in it by faith? You know, like okay, because I don't want to be next to that person. I'm just a Well, know? um, two things come to mind: to obey is better than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Meaning that there's an aspect where I need to be obedient whether I feel like it or not, because it gets what you've described as feelings based. Oh yeah, right, right. And and God doesn't call us to say when you get around to feeling like it then be righteous. Um, he's calling us to do that and to do it urgently. Um, I think that's probably the one I think thing. I it's for like, like a soldier. They don't feel like getting a really, but they just, they have to. They do. <laughs> they do it because they're called to do it and because there's a need to do it. And God, much like the God's decree or decrying the unrighteousness of society, therefore he sends the Messiah. Therefore he sends the Messiah King who is imbued with righteousness and will be righteous. He's calling us to be that imitation of God, if you will, in Ephesians 6. Okay. So Ephesians 5, or Isaiah 59 is kind of foundational to understand this is the plan of God. We are the plan of God as the army of God. To be God's arm, his right arm, as we described in, in, in verse 15. We're his right arm to go out and be righteous. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that we're called to do those things when we feel like we need to do. Yep. Kind of like forgiving somebody. Maybe I don't feel like forgiving that person, but in obedience to God, I forgive them. God forgiving them through me. And eventually that feeling changes. And our feelings begin to coincide with the fact that we've been obedient. 
Does that make am I saying that so you understand what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So I think in everything, maybe we don't feel like doing something, but because we do it in obedience, yeah, the feeling will come in. Yeah. The um I always when everybody talk about feelings about I don't feel like I don't feel like I love this person anymore. I don't feel like this, I don't feel like that. I always feel like <laughs> What goes through my head is uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna I'm gonna stand over here while you feel that, <laughs> because God's judgment will come down on us when we don't obey, no matter the no matter the reason. If we're into a feelings feelings based obedience, uh, yeah, I'm not. I don't want to be around that. That that's 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 when people start to rationalize their excuses for what to obey in the Bible. Not not that they should obey the Bible. Now they start to pick and choose. Of I just don't feel like that's what he said, or I don't feel like that's what we should do anymore. Okay, I don't see a codicil that says this is good until you know 2018. After that, it's going to be different. Um, you know, God's word never changes, and so we need to we need to obey, and that's what what He calls us to do. And what He calls us to do, as we as I mentioned, He calls us to obey urgently and and lovingly. And so all those things, you know, all those things, as Dixie said, tricks will, will they'll actually flow from that, right? Um, feelings will follow our thinking. Not not our feeling driving our thinking. The problem is, and that's why that's why counselors exist, is when people let their thinking be driven by their feelings. Um, that's a that's a bus with only three wheels and the, the steering wheel is not quite attached. It'll be a lot of fun to watch that in the wreck. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Father, we again thank you for your word. And uh, Lord, Lord, teach us how to be righteous as a church. Teach us how to be loving in our community, how to care for our neighbors, how to, how to love them with the, not only the gospel, but acts of righteousness that would exalt you and people would look to you for the purpose behind our activities. Lord, help us also understand the, the urgency of all these things, that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And these are active even now if we're not. Lord, help us to take up the gauntlet that we might be your army here on earth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.